Um, good morning, everyone, um, and thanks for making yourselves available again to, to meet and listen to Jock Harmer today, who's going to continue with our series of lectures on critical elements and green options and finding, I guess, alternative options in this country to, to ESKIM and our unreliable power supply. Just by way of background, Jock is a University of Natal geology graduate where he ended up doing an MSc. And he then did a, a PhD um, effectively part-time at the University of Cape Town. He subsequently spent about 20 years in, in research and um, teaching. Um, he spent time at the CSIR. He did a lot of isotope work. And then he progressed like many of us to the exploration and mining sector, particularly in the the junior exploration and mining sector. And he's worked in various interesting parts of the world. He's also in his time done work on rare earth elements. And I guess that will probably also come up today somewhere along the line. Anyway, thanks, Jock. Um, thanks for making yourself available and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks a lot, John. <clears throat> um, uh, between John and I, we had various, a number of different titles for the talk as things have changed. And um, after what the fantastic talks that uh, Nils and, and um, Clyde gave, um, the, the point has shifted a little bit. So the title might be a little bit misleading, but I think when we get to the end, it'll, um, you'll see where we're going to. So just to start off, um, sorry. Some reason this isn't going forward. Okay, I start off with a bit of a, a disclaimer. I'm not a, an expert in either the minerals markets or the energy sector like our previous talkers. I'm just a geologist, and um, my interest in, in, in exploration, uh, including rare earths, is is where I actually ha have developed this an interest in green energy and. Um, the, in exploring for rare earths, it's obvious that you have to know and, and study up on, on uh, where the rare earths are used, and they have a huge role to play in emissions lowering uh, technologies and stuff. And um, I developed this course when I was at Rhodes, um, largely for the explorationists, for the new uh, guys coming into exploration. If they're ex exploring for things like the critical metals, it's critical that they understand the technologies behind that. And so I put this little course together. Um, and what I'm gonna be talking about today is actually doesn't have much about rare earths at all. So I'm, I'm in a sort of field that I'm um, is very much more um, researched on, not researched on, but um, you know, uh, finding um, um, public domain information to go forward. Okay, so obviously this is climate change is, has sort of changed our world and um, the uh, low emissions, the quest for low emissions is, is, uh, is driving the green energy change. Uh, just not everyone's a believer. Donald Trump had a lot of uh, negative things to say about global warming. Um, last year at the, uh, at the COP26 conference in, in Glasgow, a whole bunch of countries agreed to phase out Coal powered um, uh, coal power stations. Some didn't. Uh, Australia being one of the prominent ones, one of the most highly emitting countries uh, per uh, capita uh, in the world. Um, and um, these sorts of diagrams are often shown, this is, these are from The Guardian, look very, very dramatic. But if you look closely at them, those are actually cooling towers. So it's mostly steam coming out. And if you look at the, um, uh, these smoke towers here, yeah, they don't seem to be emitting too much, but uh, let's not get bogged down in details. Um, some people just found it a, all a bit of a yawn. Um, and uh, one of the little activists, she wasn't impressed at all. But whatever your feeling is about uh, the, the, the change to, to, to green energy and stuff, um, there's a huge amount of investment going into clean energy. And Bloomberg have a special division now, the New Energy Fund, 
um, and they bring out uh, um, reports every now and then with very nice source of information. But this uh, diagram from there shows that between 2011, uh, 2011 through to 2019, the um, investment into new energy applications was over 300 billion per year on average. Um, if you compare that to the investments in exploration over those times, it's about at least 10 times more. So there's a lot of money going into the sector. It's not, a, um, it's not just um, uh, sentimental, let's put it that way. Okay, let's have a look at how South Africa's energy is generated. Uh, obviously, um, all largely Eskom, and most of it is um, from coal-powered stations. Um, and our power production is 96%, this is in 2015 from the DMR report, from fossil fuels. So we are heavily reliant on fossil fuel production. Um, and this graph here sort of shows it quite, quite well. Most of that is coal. And um, <clears throat> if you just do a quick calculation of, of the terawatt hours, what the, how that breaks down, coal is responsible for about 75% of the electricity we use each day. Okay, <clears throat> so is this the only way we can generate the electricity? The number of um, reports commissioned over the last five years or so, many of them involving Eskom, um, that paint another picture. Um, and this particular one here, wind and solar P, uh, uh, photovoltaic, they say that the wind potential um, and solar potential in South Africa is um, quite more than adequate to meet our electricity demands. Um, he has another report saying the same thing that in pointing out the costs of energy technologies like solar and wind and battery storage has dropped significantly in recent times since 2015 sort of. And the, the price of renewable energy is very, very competitive to the um, old school fossil fuel thing. So there's very little excuse not to get into the sector. Um, in that report, there's some quite nice maps of the solar potential in South Africa and the wind potential. And you'll see that these contours I've just um, shown down here in the solar potential here. These are these um, colors here, the very dark um, um, orange is uh, 2,200 to 2,600, averaging around say two, five kilowatt hours. And these dark reds up here are over 2,800 kilowatt hours generating capacity per square meter, okay? Um, and obviously the uh, west, the Northern Cape here is a very, very high potential for solar. And if we go across to wind, you'll see that where we've got escarpments and things, there's some very, very high generating capacity here in for example, in the Eastern Cape. And <clears throat> here we are looking at somewhere in the order of five megawatts per, he per hectare. So very, very high generating capacities. Um, Clyde mentioned the other day a little hot spot, and I, I guess what he was talking to is this little area here, which has extremely high solar potential just near Beaufort West, as well as wind potential. So just um, this website, the International uh, Renewable Energy um, Agency has um, a very, very good website where you can extract uh, data and uh, for the place around the world and generate um, some graphs and things. So I just had a look there quickly. It's, it goes up to date. It's up to date up to 2021. And so in South Africa, our installed wind and solar capacity is around about nine gigawatts. And you'll see this here is wind, big growth from about 2012 in the, in the wind uh, generation in South Africa, but also a very large increase in, in solar, voltaics and thermal. <clears throat> in 
If you convert that into actual electricity generation, the picture's somewhat different. The, you'll see that the wind, uh, the, the solar really dominates the, the overall picture. And here we're top of this little skyscraper here, we're looking at somewhere just over seven um, terawatt hours. Okay, storing electricity. Um, if we, green energy uh, applications like solar wind can only generate electricity when sun shines in solar or the wind blows with wind. And <clears throat> periods of peak generation generally don't coincide with uh, periods of peak consumption. He has uh, two nice little plots. Uh, this is wind generation in, um, I think in the Western Cape through 31 days in January, 2015. Okay, it's midsummer, So we've got lots of solar um, energy from six, seven o'clock in the morning around to about six o'clock at night, but nothing obviously once the sun goes down and concentrated, sorry, in the middle of the day, okay? And if you go to wind, you'll see that the wind is uh, uh, peaking down in the six o'clock, eight, six, four o'clock till eight o'clock sort of period, okay? <clears throat> but the fit to the consumption pattern, if you like, isn't all that good. And so um, it's obviously better to, to store the, um, if we can store the energy, we can use this all over. And the, another, another aspect of storing energy from these, these outputs is that um, you can store the energy and then release it into the grid um, when the value is the highest. And these are just, this is from the, we'll talk about the, the, the bidding things uh, uh, later, but the South African initiative to encourage uh, uh, green energy generation. Um, the standard, this, uh, uh, all the energy generated from five o'clock in the morning till half past four, okay? And then from half past nine to 10 o'clock is at a standard tariff. However, in these areas, times here of peak consumption, the, the value of the, of the, of the uh, electricity is 2.7 times that, okay? So by storing the, the um, uh, electricity, you can actually sell it at a higher rate, if you like. Um, and then the other reason to store electricity, obviously, if you, uh, if you need uh, to generate, to, to use it in mobile devices. Small ones, examples are mobile phones, tablets, and laptops, and larger ones if we're going to power motor vehicles. So what's the best solution for storing electricity? And it's very much a, a horses for courses story. It's dependent on how and where the power is going to be utilized. And so <clears throat> for mobile, if you're going with smartphones and stuff, we need uh, to store the energy in small, light, rapidly rechargeable batteries, okay? Whereas if for bulk storage, like for, for grid applications, size and portability is not, as, not that important. It's not as important as the capacity of the battery, its durability and how many discharge recharge cycles it can go through. So here's a, a, a graph that shows this quite nicely. So up this axis here is the discharge time at the rated power. In other words, how long do we need the power? And along this axis is how much electric, electrical power do we actually need, okay? So this is the sort of area we're, we're in when we're talking about generating um, electricity on a national scale. And you'll see there's a lot of talk about using lithium ion batteries for this sort of storage. And they have a limit in, in um, uh, storing large amounts of, of energy. And applications like flow batteries or molten salt technologies are a little are better applications in if, if types of uh, storage for this sort of application, okay? And so we'll have a look at some of these redox flow batteries, what they actually are. And these are um, useful in the sense because the cathode and anode, sorry, the cathode and anode um, materials are actually solutions. 
unlike in a battery where you've got uh, the they're mixed in a finite little volume, um, these can be stored in tanks. And the um, the um, the electrolyte itself being a solution, if you're charging and the water that the uh, solution you have in the battery becomes fully charged, you don't have to stop. You just pump that solution out and pump fresh, um, uncharged electrolyte in. And so you, you have an ability to store as, as much power, uh, but you can store much larger quantums of power by just having bigger tanks. And likewise, if in, in the discharge, once you've run your battery down, you can just put more electrolyte, just pump some more electrolyte in and your battery keeps going. And this is, it, it's a very quick swap, swap around that you can use. And um, the, um, these are scalable to get increased power. All you do is what they call, you have a stacked cell. So you have a whole bunch of these membranes together being fed by your electrolyte tanks. So these are big things. This is an example, a fairly small one in, in uh, the States. Um, it's a small one, um, uh, four megawatt hour um, facility. And these are from off the shelf VRFBs, uh, Somatomo Electric. I recommend you go into the website and have a look. Um, it's really interesting. So for example, here you can fill a container with the solution and the batch. So these are individual batteries. And this here is a huge rack. These tanks here are the electrolyte solutions. Um, and these are the actual cells. So just gives you an idea of how large these things can be. And they're virtually, um, they, they're infinitely scalable in a way, okay? These have implications um, on a wider scale. And this company, Red T, is a, a, it's a British company that is involved in this. And with these big, with these big storage batteries, you, the, the paradigm can change, okay? You, you can move away from a centralized grid type of system and move to what they refer to as distributed energy systems. And so within a, within a regional area, you can have an int, a, a, a sort of smaller grid that's not necessarily connected to the main grid um, fed and, and by these uh, bulk storage type of applications. Okay, we'll come back to this later because I think this has some implications to um, our mining industry and some developments in the um, 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 legal background to these things. Okay, in South Africa, we actually have a, a company, Bushfeld Energies, one of the uh, Bushfeld Minerals uh, companies that were, um, um, had a number of vanadium deposits and they've spun off in to, to, to create a little energy company focusing very much on uh, redox, uh, vanadium re redox flow batteries. And back in 2019, they announced the fact that they were developing a fairly large battery as a test case thing with, um, with Eskin. Um, and this is a 450 kilowatt hour peak output, really large battery. And that compares to probably one of the, big, the biggest ones that I know of, a uh, lithium ion battery that was done as a, almost a marketing gimmick by Elon Musk at Tesla in South Australia a few years ago. Um, which he built one of 129. This is now way more than three, three times um, that capacity, okay? And a recent update, they're actually developing at their vanadium mine, the Metco mine, an actual um, uh, redox battery that will to, to, to um, partly run the electricity at, at the mine. And they're doing this as an, as an exercise, a mini grid project uh, to supply 10% of the en energy requirements. Uh, it's quite encouraging. It's, it's very much to say, well, if you, you can talk about these things um, as much as you like, but once you actually make one and show people that it, it works, um, I think we're on the right track in, in, in developing these things here. Okay, let's move across to um, solar. 
was the main focus of what I want to talk about today, which is um, harvesting the sun's light and heat as photovoltaics, where we take the, the, the photon energy, and then the other application is actually using the sunlight itself. Now, <clears throat> this is an oldish graph, but you'll see what this is, is the cost of um, generation, okay, as a percentage compared to an arbitrary reference plant in Spain. Now, why in Spain? Well, the Spanish in the last uh, sort of five or six years have become the leading lights in developing um, solar technologies, okay? And all this is pointing out is as you have higher direct normal radiation, in other words, lots of sunlight, the, the more sunlight you actually have in the area you live in, the, the cheaper it is to generate electricity. So Spain would be over here. Spain has a large amount of, of deployed um, uh, solar power generation. So relative to what's working well in Europe, if you go to countries like where we are here, South Africa, Algeria, Morocco, okay, the uh, uh, power generation is much, much cheaper, okay? And we've uh, been deploying a lot of uh, voltaic power in South Africa. Just a couple of examples. This is uh, the Jasper solar power thing near Kimberley, uh, 96 megawatts with 180 gigawatts per annum production, okay? Um, this, this is another one, an example, um, Lesedi. And you see again, around about 75 megawatts for one of these farms. And uh, this is an important picture because you often see these photographs. It looks like these are just a bunch of solar panels put on the ground, but they are focused. So this, these, these uh, panels can tilt and they kept pointed at the sun. All right, there's just um, some, some other uh, plants and you'll see these are all in the Northern Cape, obviously, because remember the map, uh, very, very high solar radiation in that area. So in uh, amongst these ones that I've just highlighted here, there's about 750 gigawatt hours per annum of generating power. And from what I can gather from on the websites, there's about 30 active plants around the country with about 1.3 tera terawatt um, uh, power generating capacity. Okay, now let's get on to the other one, the alternative ways. And these are concentrating solar plants. These plants, in other words, are not taking the, um, um, the photon energy, it's actually using the heat of the sun itself. And this is a spectacularly new um, uh, generating system, uh, center in, in uh, Wazazat in Morocco called Nur. And there's Nord one, two, and three, um, different types of concentrated solar. And that's the generating capacity of the air is just under a terawatt um, um, of generating capacity. Okay. So let's have a look at how these things work. <clears throat> and they produce electricity by concentrating the, the uh, sun's rays, heat up a liquid, a gas, or solid, exchange medium. Um, that is then used to generate electricity via steam-driven turbines, like we normally do, okay? And most CSP plants, they con consist of a, a concentrated system, okay? And what they call a power block, and that's where the heat exchanging takes place, the creation of the steam, and to drive a conventional um, uh, uh, generator. CSPs not for everyone, obviously, it, it's critically dependent on the intensity of the sun, the direct um, uh, radiation, which is con uh, shown here. And you can see in Southern Africa, South Africa and Namibia, uh, very, very well endowed. Chile, extremely so, much of Australia, uh, the Arab countries and North Africa, okay? And listed on the right here are some of the prime areas and you'll see that um, we are in very much in the list. If you look at the deployed, installed uh, CSP around the world, um, if you have a look at South Africa here, 700 megawatts, we're sitting 
pretty well in if you compare to um, the distribution around the world. Okay, now you'll see the different colors here. Blue is operational and red is under construction. Green is in development. This is slightly old in South Africa here. We've got 100 um, megawatts that's um, under, um, under, under uh, construction stroke development and the rest is operational. So we have about 600 megawatts of operational um, system. Okay, and you'll see from this graph from 2006 through to the present that for a long time, Spain and the USA were the major <clears throat> users of this technology. The United States started it and Spain developed it and, and developed the expertise. So a lot of the companies that are involved here are Spanish-based companies. But since about 2013, 2014, a lot of new players have come in. And if we look at them, you'll see these are very much exactly the list that we said in the previous diagram where it's really suitable. So Morocco is where the Wazazat one is. They're doing a lot of development um, and deployment of these plants in Morocco, um, as are we here in, in South Africa. Okay, and these are where they're situated. This is the one that's uh, still under development, and we'll talk a bit about that later. This is the Redstone one, and you'll see um, most of these are, there's two that are 50 megawatt, but most of them are 100 megawatt uh, generating capacities. And as you'll see, they're all up in the Northern, they're all up in the Northern Cape. Okay, the uh, collector, the different collector types that are used and the ones we'll focus on, the ones that are um, most commonly used and the ones that are used here in South Africa are a central receiver, sometimes referred to as a, as a power tower where the sun is focused on um, the top of a tower with a, with a big reservoir of, of um, salt in it. Or alternatively, instead of having it focused on one point, you have these parabolic troughs with a uh, pipe holding the, the conductor, conducting the heat up, uh, heat holding material along these sort of pipes here. Okay, so the power tower, you've got sun tracking miller, mirrors around you, they're called heliostats, that focuses the sun's energy on the central receiver as the sun moves. So these things move and keep it focused on that point. Um, that in that central receiver, there are um, salts, either alkali salts or sometimes they use thermal oil. And um, that's, that heats up and can hold temperatures up to about 600 degrees centigrade. And then <clears throat> that is exchanged with using water to produce steam and to um, pass it through a conventional sort of turbine generator to produce electricity. Okay, so here we have the receiver, the heliostats focusing on um, the, where the salts are, they melt, you have your hot salt tank here, that's the heat exchanging, and there's your turbine generator. This then gets returned, cold back up into the receiver and uh, to be reheated. Here's an example, this is the, the, the one in, in uh, Wazazat, that is glowing like that, that's, because of the sun's heat. That's actually radiation, heat radiation you're seeing off the top of one of these power towers. And these are all the heliosats. This is one in South Africa that was one of the first developed and I think it, was, it started producing electricity in 2017. In Uppington, if you've driven past there, you'll see it's very, very prominent. And uh, if you just have a look at the distribution of the heliostats, you'll see it's fairly heart shaped. We'll have a look at the Nora one just now, and you'll see that the distribution is quite different. And I'll talk about that later. The other type is a parabolic trough. So this is a, a better diagram. Here you've got uh, the pipes holding the actual heat exchanger, and these um, parabolic troughs, mirrors, reflect, uh, focus the heat onto these pipes, and that is then ducts the, the, the hot, so they normally use oil, hot liquid off to the same sort of ex um, exchanger and the same um, generating pr um, process. Here are some examples, and you'll see here again, this is glowing because the sun's heat is actually focused on there. 
So this will be where the transfer oil is stored and that gets then ducted out to the power block for um, heat generating, okay? Now, this Senna company, which is a, a Spanish company, they took the uh, molten salt that was used in the tower type of system and they started using it in um, parabolic systems as well. So in other words, the parabolic system, instead of using the, the heated oil to go and uh, create steam and generate power, they used it to melt the salt, okay? And so this is just the um, uh, justification or explanation of what it is. And that these molten salts, they hold their heat for, for a fair amount of time. So in other words, you can use the heat in, in the, the hot salt, you can store that heat and um, uh, keep, the, keep that generating capacity. So what, so here, that's what we saw before. This is this molten salt thermal energy. These have a very, very high heat capacities. They, they, it's, it, it's relatively easy to hold that heat in to the salt and that gives you a, a, a way of storing power. Okay, so here is an example. Um, I think this is from um, the Crescent Dunes facility, which is in California. It's a, it's a scan through a normal day. So the um, yellow here is the sun. So the heat coming from the sun, you'll see mornings it heats up. Okay, and so that's tracking the sun during the day. Now, what these plants do is you'll see here, this is the generating of electricity. There's no major demand for electricity here. So instead of generating electricity, they just melt more and more salt, okay? When it gets to the demand increases, you then start using that heat to generate electricity, okay? So the, um, the bit that you save, the heat that you store in the salt, you can then use once the sun goes once the sun goes down. You can then generate electricity going forward. Okay, so this is the um, the energy collection into the salt, and this is using that stored energy to generate electricity. And so you can actually extend the time that you can generate your electricity. This is a little bit more complicated, shown in a bit. It shows exactly what's going on here. So. This blue line here is where you're generating the, uh, from this, the, the sun, okay? And um, here is where you're storing the, um, the heat that you stored in the salt, where you start to use your stored salt, okay? So that is directly generated from sun, the blue one. The green is where you're generating from your stored um, salt, okay? And that is your effective extra, the storage time, the extra generating time that you buy from using this, this salt uh, generation. Okay, so these plants have been, um, um, we've got a number of the plants in South Africa. The, the first two that were um, installed, Solar One, uh, Key and Kaku Solar One, this was a parabolic, this was a power tower. These were built just to supply um, um, uh, electricity while the sun was up, if you like, okay? So this, <clears throat> this uh, both of them, obviously when the sun goes down, the salts are still, are still hot, okay? So in uh, the, the Uppington one was able to run at full capacity for two hours after the sun went down. And but the idea was to supply electricity to Uppington, okay, that was, that was great. But from then on, all of these actually have extra storage, capa storage capacity for extra salt, okay? And you'll see down here is the storage time that we've actually, that, that these have. Bockport, nine hours, five hours, five hours, four and a half hours. And this plant at the end here, <clears throat> Redstone, which is under development, we'll talk about why it's still under development, it was supposed to come on, on stream and scheduled for around about 2020. The updated is the fourth quarter of next year. Um, 
that has the capacity to store for 12 hours. That effectively means that this solar plant can generate um, electricity around the clock. Okay, so let's have a look at what these things look, some of them look like. Uh, this is the Taku Solar One near Pofado, one of the early ones that was set up. There's your reflectors. Um, this is the power tower we've seen before. That's where the, you can see this is operational. You can see a bit of the steam coming out the top. And now these are the ones with more salt storage. You see these here are our big tanks. Um, this is the Ilanga one. These are tanks that are, have you know, excess salt, if you like, where they store the, that's where they hold the extra heat to generate after the sun goes down. Um, this one has five hours of storage. And here, Katu, um, you can see these big storage tanks. All right. <clears throat> this is the oddest impression of the redstone um, plant. It'll be 100 megawatts with the 12 hours of generating capacity. And it's sited right next to these two uh, photovoltaic PV plants that have been around for quite a while. Um, we'll, this, this artist impression is essentially the, the Wazazite plant just dropped in on this photograph. Okay, right, why is it still under development? Uh, there have been a number of del delays and most of it is due to our friend Eskim. Um, it took them, this is in 2017, um, where when these um, awards are granted, Eskim basically is the offtake um, agent and they need to sign these. And this is you know, one bid that was in, they delayed it for a year and a half. And <clears throat> two of these, two of these plants from the same uh, um, um, developer, okay, one was signed, uh, Redstone was next on the table, but it wasn't, and it delayed the um, start of this project by at least one and a half years. Okay, just to give an example, this is some of the details of the uh, one in was in uh, Morocco. Um, and you can see here that they had, that has storage as well. This is a photovoltaic. But if you look at the times here, it's more or less the same time as we were installing our CSP plants. But they're on schedule and they have now nearly a, ter a terawatt of generating capacity. Um, in production working here in, um, in Morocco. Okay, so let's just go quickly through this uh, Renewable Energy Independent Power Procurement Program. It's a, another one of these big acronyms. There have been a bunch of different bids. The way it works is that the regulators say, okay, we will prepare to put up um, over here, 18, make available 1850 megawatts megawatts of wind, solar PV, solar CSP, et cetera, et cetera. And then people can bid for it, okay? And then the, when the, the people that are, the, the, the bids are accepted. That's what this awarded bid means. Okay, so these, there's been a number of these bids. Yeah, you can see there was bid three. It had, um, it was extended to add more CSP, but that was the last, Okay, show, sorry, then in, in, in 4B, this is the, um, the redstone one, okay? Um, the bid five was canceled and there's been delays, um, <clears throat> um, which I think we'll see later. But if you're interested in these sorts of things, the, there's a very good website with these um, renewable energy, the procurement programs. Uh, that's the, that's the URL. And there you can actually go and search the database and drop down and select all the things and get all the wind and all the actual new energy stuff is there. It's a very, quite a good resource. And here's just an example, the actual capacity of um, the CSP plants that are out there. Okay. Um, this program has been widely lauded by um, press around the world. Here's one example, one of the world's best 
renewable energy tenders systems, okay? But there's room for improvement. And they go through a number of reasons why. One of them is just the regulatory things, like this is an artist's impression simply because of mess ups with the regulations. Um, and this is explained here, we saw this just now, okay? Bit window five, okay, if you just go through here, um, that was launched in 12th of April, 2021. The 25 bidders were announced and on the 28th of October, okay? And these have not been signed off. And the timelines for these preferred bidders to come on stream, to, the, to sign them, is expected by no later than the end of September this year. Okay, so it's taken 18 months delay in actually getting those things signed up. Now, each of these bids, there's a, 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 a contractor who's raised finance and everything and is just sitting waiting for the mineral M MRE to get the act to gear. Okay, one of the other problems is actually getting plants uh, built. Um, this is a, a publication from um, uh, 2015, I think, 2016, it only has the first three bids. They highlight problems, causes of delays in construction, okay? Weather, 64, not much you can do about that, but 26% strikes or social unrest, okay? Um, Supply chain, small, construction delays, together 10%, but a lot of it just from, um, you know, union strikes or local um, disagreements. Okay, so it's, the title of the thing had something about mining. Just wanna finish off quickly. Um, there's quite a lot in the, in the sort of mining press and stuff for a number of years now. There's a lot of talk about um, coming to an alternative to um, uh, supply electricity to the mines with, because of Eskom's unreliability, okay? Um, here, again, November 21, massive power projects, but they want government to cut red tape. Um, the, um, Minerals Council talking about the mining industry could add in 3.9 uh, uh, gigawatts of power generation, but wants clarity on the rules. Again, problems with the regulatory system, okay? Anglo-American earlier this year committed itself to take all its South African operations uh, completely off the grid, okay? And in June, there was what, probably one of the most important um, changes in regulations um, in this regard. I think it surprised most people. Ramaphosa announced that the, uh, the limit uh, beyond which you have to actually get a, a license to generate power and sell power on was, was shifted from one megawatt before to 100 megawatts. Okay, the recommendation from the resource minister had been 10 megawatts, but he obviously got overruled to 100 megawatts. Now, all of the, um, uh, the wind generating projects in the, in the um, procurement plan are maxed at 75 megawatts, okay? The solar, the concentrated solar is at 100 megawatts. So what that means is virtually all of these new schemes that are coming on, okay, can be standalone. They do not need to, um, if, you, if you can use the power, you can generate it and you don't um, have this limitation. You don't have to get a license. Um, and that I think is, is a big open door now to, um, to start for the mining industry, I think, to start thinking outside the box. Um, just to highlight the fact that all of these plants, okay, are under the limit, would be under the limit, 
okay? Um, all of these plants are based in the Northern Cape. And um, it seems like a, um, the, anyway, yeah, in the Northern Cape with, with places like Achenes and Kamsburg uh, having problems with electrical supply for their operations, it would be an obvious set to actually take, get an offtake with these sorts of um, users or future users, okay? And just to get back to the distributed energy storage idea, um, the, the mining industry is probably the, 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 the sort of best to fit into this type of model, where you have a smaller off-grid, mini-grid, uh, powered by your own generating um, plants. Um, not linked to the, to the national grid, not beholden to ESCOM. And with that 100 megawatt limitation, I think that um, really comes into, this, into the, the, the um, sector. It's, it's, it's about the right amount to, to get going on. So that's, that's all I've got. I'm sure there are lots, lots of questions and um, um, comments. Thanks. Right, thank you very much. So uh, Thanks, we'll take questions from the floor. From I think John Brist, Dr. Bristow has got something to ask us. Job, just in terms of um, capital expenditure, um, how, how do the how does a big um, solar panel um, system compare with the with the um, the other option that you've talked about at some length today, the the molten salt? Okay, am I switched on, Henny? Yeah, not yet. Okay. There we go. Um, yeah, the your camera is not on. Okay, uh, sorry, I sorry, I'll get myself on. Uh, right there, I am. Okay, um, a very important thing here is well, this, this the concentrated solar is more expensive per kilowatt than say photovoltaics and wind. Okay, but what you have to bear in mind is these salt enabled plants, if you like, they actually have the, 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 the power storage built in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the cost of, of, of uh, photovoltaics and wind doesn't take into account the storage cost to allow that power to actually be used on demand as it were. And I think that's, that's the important difference. Um, so like if plants like the redstone one um, is, is brought on, then you know the, 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 the actual development cost is the final cost. Yeah, and I understand that, but just, just a round figure, I mean, I'm just interested um, in general. I mean, are you looking at orders of magnitude or, or, you know, obviously the great benefit is the fact that you can you know, store and then hopefully as they get better, run it through the night. Um, just an idea though, in, in terms of broad numbers. Um, I just want to go back to my, I didn't, I didn't actually do a direct comparison, but the, in terms of the, I just want to have a look here. Because these CSB plants, they, uh, just look here. The they run from about five hundred million dollars to over eight hundred, nine hundred million dollars. Okay, heading for a billion dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, as in all these things, as the technology rolls out, it becomes cheaper. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, it's just yeah. interesting. I mean, you know, given given the situation in South Africa and not being particularly um, investor friendly and and as you've highlighted jock i mean some of these delays if you're going to build a, a 900 million or a, even a 500 million dollar project um you know you don't you don't want to sit around and wait on your hands no, absolutely um, you know, if yeah. you make that commitment you obviously want to be able to get on and do it um you know the, the flip side of course is the is the is the pvs are sort of cheap and quick and nasty um you know so i guess you have to sort of balance the two. Yeah, because mm. there are there are 
stats out and graphs for um, you know the the cost per sort of kilowatt hour. You know, um, each of those. the problem is that the as I say the the um, the solar and the wind, the solar PV and the wind, they don't include the storage costs in there. So if you're going to do it like which a lot of people seem to be talking about is using lithium ion batteries, those you know are coming down in price, but they are expensive. And it's an added thing that needs to be put on, um, added to the cost of, of that source of electricity. Yeah, Jack, I think it goes back to sort of the overall, you know, plan. And um, again, it comes back to policy. Um, you know, Clive, Clive, obviously, Clyde, sorry, Mallison did, a, you know, a very good study looking at the, the big picture and the comparison of all the systems. And, and I guess that's really, what it's about, um, you know, they're, they're, they're somewhat horses for courses. I mean, for households and fact, um, factories or, or, or malls, for example, you know, big malls that um, see most of their traffic through the day, you know, a PV system, which you can fit on these massive um, roof structures on, on the malls, you know, probably works. And then you would have small batteries, you know, really just to give you an evening um, session in the shops yeah. and then, you know, lighting no. for security. No, absolutely. Clyde, you know, Clyde's, um, that, that model of his was, was really, really impressive. And it's, you know, I agree. I'm not, you know, I'm not punting this as-, no, as Absolutely, a, not saying that, yeah. yeah. It's just a, a really interesting technology. And I thought of focusing on it because Clyde in his talk said that, you know, CSP had been cut off at the knees by the growth that photovoltaics and yet, We've been rolling out quite a lot of this stuff here. Morocco is putting a lot of money in, in the Arab countries. The in the in the table I put up there, you'll see this ACWA Aqua. There, it's it's an Arabian base. Now they've taken over parts of the technologies, the Spanish ones, and they're actually quite a big player in the game now. And they're developing <laughs> these things in, in Morocco and whatnot. And the, 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 the other thing that I, that I find quite amazing is that, you know, those are, those are quite big quantums of money and there's, there seems to be no problem raising them. Mm. And the number of the South African banks that are involved is, you know, in these projects and that are, is, is quite impressive. And so, you know, if you think about it, they're not going, they're not going in there just for fun or because it's, it's, the good, it's the thing to do. They're going in because they can make money. So if you can make money at the moment where you have this, you know, offtake agreement with um, with Eskom, that is the final end to it. Um, you know, if you if you think about them, if, if if you want to go to these little dispersed or distributed grid systems where you don't have that, I mean, the the, the investment must be infinitely more attractive. And yeah. so if you can raise it under under the constrained things that we are at the moment, it's, it, it, I see no reason why it wouldn't be even more attractive. Yeah, absolutely. No, there's definitely, you know, that comes back to my point, there's definitely a need for a sort of, you know, grand plan without getting bogged down in, in paper, but, you know, um, they're different, they're different options, and we should be looking, you know, aggressively at, at the range of options, um, and making, making the best. Just, I mean, and just for interest, um, I know all the mining companies are talking about, you know, going off grid or setting up their own power generation systems. Do you, you, you must have done a little bit, bit of work on that. I mean, what are they typically looking at in terms of, of infrastructure or, or types of, 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 of power? I haven't actually seen too much recently. And I think, I think what's happened is, is uh, you know, the, the president's lifting of that level to 100 megawatts is, you know, everybody's got to go back to, not go back to square on, it's very positive, but it opens, opens the doors wider. You know, you, you, yeah. you can actually, you know, Think bigger, and, and uh, it, it's. Um, I think it, you know it, it's a it's a real paradigm shift. It'll be inter interesting to see if hopefully the, you know, the the mining industry will pick it up and run with it. But um, mm. yeah. the the other thing that doing some research on the on the bid, I haven't actually needed to look at that before. And going through that system, there's quite a lot online, and the rules have changed from the time that started through the different bid windows and the stuff close to now. You. You can go online and you can get you know the materials that you would need to fill in and and go the loops you have to jump through in order to to get bid in and i'll send you some 
<laughs> no, well, hope, you know, hopefully it's it is getting better and more streamlined because you know wh wherever you go in this country, um, and obviously you know the mining sector and exploration sector. I mean, the red tape is scary, mm. and if only we could get rid of you know more and more of the red tape, um, you know, we would have a, a much more healthy industry and 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 growth, particularly in the small and junior sector. So so yeah, let's look forward, or we look forward to to uh, you know improved um, policy regime and less red tape yeah we'll John, is this sort of do you have an, an handle on if we had to go let's say primarily on solar power uh, you know just that and wind uh, in terms of the footprint percentage wise uh, we've got all of this area but how much you know how much will it actually upset the farmers <laughs> And how much area, or is it negligible in terms of the bigger picture? Just because people talk about that, and that's one of the first questions of objection. They say, well, look, you're going to be having a forest of, you know, of, of mirrors out there. Um, is, it, is, it, is it that big? Well, the thing is, where, you know, where, the, where the peak generating <clears throat> areas are for, for solar is in the Northern Cape. And, you know, you're not cramped for space there you know there's not a it, so it, it's it's a, we, we're very lucky in that sense you know if 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 your best um, sun areas were in you know where there's a lot of population a lot of farming a lot of other things going on it, it, it does become a bit of a problem but you know i think with us we're you know we're pretty well set for that so um yeah i mean yeah, uh, yeah henny it was quite interesting and i um you know, in Clyde's talk, just thinking back to it, he actually talked about the footprint and, you know, came to the conclusion that, it, um, you know, PV and solar, you know, and, or oh, sorry, solar and winds and, you know, the sort of options Jock's talking about would at the end of the day end up with a very small footprint compared yeah. to, you know, existing mining operations. And, and I guess, you know, logically that probably makes sense and you know Clyde Clyde certainly did a lot of homework and, and knows this, that that whole business well but if you look at you know mines particularly say in the eastern well it used to be the eastern Transvaal and Pumalanga you know by the time you add in the mine infrastructure and then the then the tailings dumps and the you know the overburden that you've moved and then the lack of, of uh, you know real and proper um, rehabilitation and then i guess also you know all the consequences of acid mine water or acid mine drainage you know there, there there has to be benefits and you know looking at these alternatives which um you know have a footprint but sure as hell they they're a whole lot cleaner you know i, I don't think we realize the costs at yeah. now at the stage of of you know pollution and acid mine drainage um it's scary i think and i don't no, think it's really good the, I mean, the, 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 something that uh, you, people don't often t talk about with with the the, the thermal power stations. Um, <clears throat> when I was at the CSR, the atmospherics guys there, we had a contract to go. You know, um, acid acid rain was what's going to going to kill us in those days. You know, that was the biggest concern. And so they went and did a survey and 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 found that the actual SO two coming from the power stations was 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 small wasn't very much but where the so2 was coming from was spontaneous combustion on the waste dumps in the coal things you know sulfide there and so it wasn't coming out of the power stations but feeding the power stations was creating the so2 in the thing so you know what i mean it's yeah i think as a, as a power station you could say well look you know we, we're not emitting more than xyz but the the, the coal miners that um, and this because the, the coal is sulfur rich, sulfide rich, and, and, and that is a, something to bear in mind as well. Uh, looking at the crystal ball and, and you know, let's just leap into the future a little bit here and say that the Western province is not going to get on with the rest of South Africa. Would they be able to uh, become self sufficient in power? Would they have to buy in? From the rest of the country, is there a possibility? Is it posturing, or do you think they'll actually be able to do it? No, we'll do an alliance with the Northern Cape and be a, a sort of a, <laughs> a two province. <laughs> we'll, we'll swap. We'll swap wine for power. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Any, I, I think um, if you listen to you know the talk, um, you know in in the province, and I guess um, Jock's touched on it briefly. I mean, there's a lot of um, solar power going up in sort of the northern part of of the Western Cape. I think I've corrected Jock, and and also it's obviously it has wind potential. Um, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm not smart enough to know whether you could you know build enough wind farms and and solar farms to to take yourself off the rest of the country. Okay, um, thanks, Jock, and and thanks, Henny. Is, does anyone or any of you have any other further questions, Jock? Comments? Sorry, I just pressed the wrong button there. <laughs> Time just to say thank you very, very much, and um, yeah, we'll see you guys next week. Or well, what is the program ahead of us? Um, Henny, that's a good point. Next week, we, we're going to be doing a, fi uh, a Friday presentation with um, Stephen Davey, who's talking about um, silica. Uh, just a reminder, it's the year of glass. And we, we put together a sort of combined couple of sessions with the U3A here in Hermanus. So next week, Stephen will give a very interesting talk, and I've seen the, the, the uh, PowerPoint on on um, silica sand and where it sort of occurs here in, in the Cape and where they mine it um, for making glass. Um, and um, we look forward to that. Um, there's a lot of effort gone into it and you've got some fascinating information. But just bear in mind that will be on Friday morning at 10, not Thursday morning at 10.30. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Then uh, we see you not through the week, but through the window. Thanks, Annie. Thanks, Jock. Thanks. Have a good one. Yeah.